Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reimer, and thank you for the warm welcome. My friends, it is an incredible honor to be with you today. I want to begin by acknowledging that we're on the traditional unceded territories of the Anishinaabeg Algonquin people. And it's always an opportunity for us to reflect on the injustice that the first people of this country face and our collective responsibility to fight for justice for the first people. We're all this year feeling the loss of Ed. I remember being with him at many of these events, looking out to him in the crowd, shouting him out, and telling him that I want to be him when I grow up. And I, I always appreciated how he would be always listening so passionately and wanting to learn. And he was always reminding us of the reason we're here, for our fight for true democracy. And true democracy meaning a democracy that includes human rights, economic justice, social justice, and political freedoms. C'est triste que Ed n'est pas là ici, n'est pas ici aujourd'hui, mais sa vision, sa passion continue avec l'institution. These are difficult times for Canadians. I'm going to reflect on what it means for a lot of people. The cost of everything is up. Finding a place to call home is more expensive than ever before. Right now, the average cost for a two-bedroom apartment in most big cities in this country is upwards of $3,000 a month. $3,000 a month. Many families are seeing their mortgage payments go up by hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And grocery bills. It seems like there is no end in sight to the rise of grocery prices. When you go into a grocery store to buy your food, I've heard so many stories of people going in and buying something or picking up something they would usually buy and then putting it back on the shelf because they can't afford it. I remember what that's like in my 20s, literally when I was 20, and my kid brother who's here today, I took care of him when he was 15, and I remember the anxiety, the worry, the fear that I felt working multiple minimum wage jobs never feeling like I was able to get my head above water, always worried that I wasn't, be able, wasn't going to be able to provide enough for him. I'll never forget that feeling of that constant worry and anxiety. And I want no one to ever experience that again, and that's why I'm a politician, why I'm fighting for working people. C'est pourtant ce que ressentent de nombreuses personnes dans tous les pays. Ils voient les grandes entreprises réaliser les bénéfices records et leurs salaires leur salaire ne suffisent pas à payer les factures. Ils constatent que la cupidité des grandes entreprises fait grimper le prix des épiceries, de l'essence et de leurs factures mensuelles de téléphones portables et d'Internet. And for almost a decade, Justin Trudeau has been ignoring this problem. He talks about growing the middle class while letting corporations gouge working people, hardworking people. And everyone in this room knows that Pierre Polyev would just make things worse. Now, now more than ever, Canadians need someone to show up for them with real, meaningful help. And that's exactly what New Democrats have been doing. Our team rolled up our sleeves and we got to work so Canadians could pay less and get more. We used our power to deliver dental care for millions of Canadians, saving people on average $1,300 a year. And not just money, it saves people from needless pain. We also made sure that affordable childcare is enshrined in law. We forced the Liberals to give 10 paid sick days to federally regulated workers. And we delivered for the first time in Canadian history anti-scab legislation.
Our team worked hard, and as a result, we forced this government to invest billions of dollars into affordable housing and billions specifically for housing for Indigenous communities. We forced the government to put in place a framework for single-payer pharmacare, even though the Liberals fought for insurance companies and big pharma time and time again. And because we demanded more, millions of Canadians are going to get free birth control and diabetes medication and medical devices. And in this upcoming budget, we will see a national food program included, something new Democrats like Jack Layton and Olivia Chow have been fighting for, for years. We're going to make that happen. Just 25 new Democrat MPs made this happen. Imagine what we could do with a new Democratic government at the federal level. Mes amis, ensemble, nous avons accompli des réels progrès, mais il reste encore beaucoup à faire. Les Canadiens traversent plus d'une crise. Ils sont pris aussi avec une crise du coût de la vie et ils vivent avec les impacts des crises climatiques. We all remember what this was like in the last, in the past summer, keeping our children inside because wildfire smoke from blazes hundreds of miles away were filling the air and it was unsafe for kids to be outside. Heat waves are literally killing people in their homes in our country. Seniors, people living with disabilities, and people who just can't afford to have an air conditioner. Families live with their bags packed by the door in fear of having to evacuate at a moment's notice because of forest fires. Droughts make it harder to grow food and drive up food prices. Extreme weather shuts down businesses and costs people their jobs. Let's be clear, it's working people that end up paying the price for the climate crisis. They pay for it with their homes, their jobs, and sometimes even their lives. And there is no question what is causing these disasters. It is fossil fuels. La lutte contre la crise climatique n'est pas faculative. Il faut changer nos façons de faire. Changer la façon dont nous chauffons nos maisons et la façon dont nous nous déplaçons. De manière à réduire notre consommation de combustibles fossiles. Et la lutte contre la crise climatique ne peut se faire que si nous sommes unis. Fighting the climate crisis can only be done if we are united. It requires political will, but it also requires solidarity. It can't be done by dividing Canadians against each other, and it certainly can't be done by lying to Canadians about the causes or the solutions. And it can't be done by letting working people, by letting working families bear the cost of climate change while big polluters make bigger and bigger profits. Pierre Poliev ne se soucie pas de lutter contre la crise climatique, mais il ne se soucie pas non plus de lutter contre la crise du coût de la vie. S'il se soucie réellement de faire baisser le prix des produits alimentaires, il s'attaquerait à Galen Weston et des autres PDG d'épicerie qui réalisent des profits records et utilisent l'inflation comme couverture pour augmenter les prix. If Pierre Polyev really cared about bringing down fuel prices, he would take on big oil and gas who reap record profits and still beg for government subsidies. But Pierre Polyev doesn't care about working families. He doesn't care about working class people. He cares about helping his lobbyists that run his campaign and run his party. Pierre Polyev has one goal when it comes to the climate crisis. 
He wants to help big polluters make more money and obey fewer laws. Not only does he have no plan to fight the climate crisis, the ideas he has put forward would make it worse. And, frankly, do nothing to actually bring down the cost of living. Droughts mean food prices go up. Fires and floods mean home insurance are more expensive. Having to rebuild washed out roads and bridges every few years drives up property taxes. Not to mention the health cost of not being able to breathe the air. Pierre Polyev wants to ignore the health crisis caused by the climate crisis. He wants to ignore the climate crisis entirely. But Justin Trudeau has divided Canadians on who pays the cost of fighting it. He doesn't see the climate crisis as an opportunity to unite us to take on this threat. He sees it as a political wedge. He gives exemptions where he wants to buy votes, and he hands out taxpayer-funded subsidies to big polluters. Canadians know that just isn't fair. You see, Justin Trudeau never seems to run out of money to hand out to fossil fuel companies, but the program designed to help people pay for heat pumps won't get any more funding until 2027. A report this week, in fact, pointed out that Justin Trudeau is delaying $15 billion in climate investment. That's money that was supposed to go to help Canadians buy heat pumps, invest in cleaner transit, and make infrastructure more climate resilient. Something is fundamentally wrong when the government says yes to big oil and gas and says no to hardworking Canadians trying to make better choices for the planet and their wallet. That is not the way to build the consensus and solidarity that we need to take on this fight. I believe we can do so much better than the distraction and the division of these two other parties. Together, we can build a plan to fight the climate crisis that unites Canadians. We need strategies that work for cities and different strategies that work in northern, rural, and remote communities. We recognize that Indigenous people are the first stewards of this land and respect their role as decision makers about their own lands and their own resources. We must use the power of government to drive change, not just rely on the free market to fix these big problems. Any climate change plan must create good jobs, good union jobs here at home. Our vision, our plan, we will lower people's monthly bills, not add more costs. We will create affordable, low-carbon options and not punish people who can't afford to change the way they get to work or heat their homes. Big polluters will pay more to fight the climate crisis that they themselves have caused. We will make sure that there are laws, there are tough rules in place to protect our air, water, and land. We will meet our emissions targets so that we can all breathe the air and live in safety and security. But most importantly, we will build a plan to fight the climate crisis that unites Canadians, that unites us in this fight instead of dividing us. We all lose if Canadians are forced to choose between an affordable life and fighting the climate crisis. The only ones who win when Canadians are divided in this way are big polluters who are allowed to continue to make more money while the planet burns. Mes amis, je n'ai jamais été aussi convaincu de la nécessité d'un gouvernement fédéral néo-démocrate. Personne n'a regardé de plus près que moi les libéraux de Justin Trudeau. En réalité, Les libéraux n'agissent que lorsque les néo-démocrates les, les y obligent. Et je peux vous dire qu'ils pourraient faire beaucoup plus pour améliorer la vie. I think a lot about the country that I want to build. And a lot of my reflections have been inspired by Ed Broadbent. 
He wanted every child to be able to dream of a future without limits and to know that they can make those dreams come true. I want them to know the value and rewards of hard work, but also I want them to always have time for joy. That's what we want for every child. That's what we want for every person. Uh, we want a federal government that works for you so you can build a good life, a home you can afford, a family doctor available when you need one, enough money left over for a vacation, work that pays the bills and leaves you with enough energy to play with your kids at the end of the day. I know I need that. Less worry, more joy. Less fear, more hope. Less greed, more compassion. And I promise you, together, this is a Canada we will build. A Canada where we measure our success by how well all of us live, not just those at the top. A Canada where we look out for one another. Where leaders use their power to serve the people, not CEOs and corporate profits. Where we are united by our common values, not divided by hatred. This is the Canada we believe in. That's a Canada that Ed would be proud of. Friends, it is not too late to build a better world. I invite you to join me on our journey to build this world together. Thank you. So I know we're going to be kind of going into lunch, but thanks for sticking around for a couple of questions. Yeah, of course. How you doing? I'm good. How you feeling? I'm feeling, you know, feeling vibes. You're, you're, How's you're the bringing the energy. Me, me bringing the energy? Yeah. You bringing the energy. No, no, but I like the energy you bring to the table, always. <laughs> Come on. Do y'all know Lori Antonin? No, Lori's, don't. No, let Lori's him not a big do deal. this. No, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Make some noise with Lori Antonin. He's a big deal. How are the girls? The girls are awesome. I brought the youngest to They're the Broadbent. Uh, reception last night. Oh, nice. Yes. She was uh, the hit of the okay. show. Like, I think no one wanted to talk to me anymore. They just wanted to, like, pick her up. So that was, that was cute. I love that uh, she's partying with <laughs> <Yes>. Pop. <laughs> That's great. Yes, she was. <laughs> okay. I will make this quick. Sure. Do you have a few questions? Yeah. So let's get into it, All right. You we? ready? Okay. So the confidence and supply agreement was, has delivered so, so, so much for people, from pharmacare to dental care. I mean, these are some historic gains. But it's also had its fair share of critiques. And I want you to tell us, what do you say to those critiques? What do you mm. say to those folks? Well, what I hear is a lot of people that are really fed up with Justin Trudeau. That's yep. what I hear a lot, right? And I could tell you, I'm also fed up. And I can tell you the reason why is I see the liberals up close. Like I see Justin Trudeau as prime minister and the liberals very up close. I probably have the best insight into what they do. And I can tell you it is extremely frustrating mm. when you have that much power to make life better for people and don't use it. Yep. To be so out of touch, and, and you can feel this when you speak to liberals, they're so out of touch with everyday people's struggles. They don't have that urgency yep. to do something about it. That is incredibly frustrating. It makes me feel fed up. Uh, it would be a lot easier to just stand up and vent in parliament and to to attack the government to to rail against them to like i feel that like it's very like to the point of being fed up and just wanting nothing to do with them but then i think it's not about me and what i would say to people is i wish you were with me in the park in edmonton where i met brianna mm. and brianna is a mom struggling like everyone else with a high cost of living and she told me that it's everything that she can do to keep a roof over the head for her kids and to put food on the table. And so she's had to sacrifice. And I remember playing in the park with her and her kids, and I can still imagine their smiles. I can still picture their smiles. And each of her five kids went to the dentist for the first time in their life because of the program we fought for. And they are happier, they're healthier. Her eldest had a rare condition that would have never been caught but for that visit to the dentist. Right. He's gonna have an amazing outcome. I think about Brianna, and that's what motivates me, making sure we can make a difference in people's lives. For a lot of folks, it's hard to imagine this because 
it's hard to imagine like what we're doing because people look through it through the lens of, of liberals and conservatives whose only goal is power right. we became new democrats because we actually want to make people's lives better and to make people's lives better means concretely changing things in their life. And so now that Brianna and her kids are gonna get dental care, seniors are gonna get dental care, that's for New Democrats, that's the victory. That's why we got into this. Yeah. We didn't choose the easy path, we chose the hard path because we wanna make a difference. And making that difference means the world to us. Take that, critics. <laughs> <laughs> um, in your speech, you said no one has had a closer look at Justin Trudeau's liberals than me. Mm. So you're not a big fan of how this government really works. <laughs> um, good. <laughs> but what have you learned about how to and how to not govern? Mm. Well, I mean, it is like we say this a lot and I, and I genuinely mean it. The, the liberals being out of touch, Justin Trudeau being out of touch. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know where that comes from, but like, I know where I come from. And when I was 20, I literally had to take care of my kid brother. It was me and him. And folks were always trying to do the math because we looked close in age, but I would take him to places kind of as his like surrogate father. They're like, oh, this is not really adding up. The math for him to be that age and that height and you to be that age and that height, and this is not really <laughs> making sense. But I, I remember like the struggles. Like it was tough. Like we as a family went through a lot of ups and downs. We struggled and I had to always be worried about how do I make sure I provide for my kid brother. Like him going hungry was something I could never let happen. I remember my parents lost their home. I remember all those worries. And I know people are feeling that same sense of worry right now. And for me, what that does is it drives me to do something. Let's yeah. like make things better. Let's yeah. fight to improve things. And what's so frustrating and what I would never do is this complacency of the liberals. This kind of like arrogance that they're just always going to be in power and this lack of any urgency to deal with the struggles people are living with. Like the fact that food prices have outpaced general inflation for two years and they just ignored that, right? And to know clearly, and, and this is something that Pierre Polyev knows as well. He's no, seen the evidence, he knows the economists that are pointing out that it is corporate greed driving food inflation that's driving up the high cost of food and just never wanting to tackle that. We know why, because his chief strategist is one of the biggest lobbyists for the corp, largest corporate 100%. grocery store. Yeah. But uh, that's what I, that's what the difference between us and them is that we feel people's real pain and we want to use the power that we have to make people's lives better. Yeah, and that's what we need, 100%. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about that Pierre Polio. Oh, boy. Um, now, you spent some time contrasting the other two leaders, yes. and in particular, Pierre. Yes. Polyev. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> we're facing an We know how you feel about it. <laughs> we know how I feel about it. <laughs> Labor. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're facing an ongoing global trend of right wing uh, populism where Pierre Polyev and figures like him have been gaining more traction. What does this mean for our communities and working people? Mm. Well, I, I know what it means for working people because I know what he's really about and I know what he wants to do. Yeah. So what I would say to working people, knowing who Pierre Polyev and knowing what he wants to do, I would say to working people, Pierre Polyev is lying to you. He is openly lying to you. He has no interest in helping working people out. We don't even have to go back to the Harper era. We can go back there and there's lots of evidence. I can just tell you what he has already said since being leader. He, is, he wants to get rid of public universal health care, openly. He says that all the time. He says, that he wants to have the last minister, the last federal minister for health in Canada. Well, what does that mean? That means he wants the federal government to no longer invest in health. Mm -hmm. That would be the complete erosion and, and elimination of public health care. He is against pensions. He wants to attack people's pensions, take that away from people. He wants to take EI away from people. He wants to openly take away the dental care program, the pharma care program. He wants to take away every scrap of dignity for working people. That's what he wants to do. Yep. So he is lying to working people when he says he's on their side. He is not. We know whose side he's on. He's on the side of big corporations. He's the side of the lobbyists that run his party. That's whose side he's on. And I would tell working people, you deserve a lot better than that. You deserve someone who's actually gonna fight the real problems we're going through. If the real problems of what we're going through are corporate greed driving up the cost of groceries, then ignoring that is never going to fix the problem. We have to go after that. We've got to tackle corporate greed. We've got to make sure consumers are protected. Yeah. We've got to build homes that we can actually afford. So that's what I would say to workers, that you deserve a lot better, 
and that he is not on your side. He is lying to you and that New Democrats are the real allies of working people we've always been and always will be. 100%. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Let's quickly move into an uh, issue that's top of mind, top of mind for people housing. Mm -hmm. Now, the Broadbent Institute just released a new report called Dreams and Realities on the Home Front. And this is on Canada's housing crisis. Now, one of the main findings in this report is how strongly a majority of Canadians feel that the market can't fix the housing crisis. So the polling also showed that this is a this is a clear majority of Canadians in favor of a government getting back into the housing, mm. into the business of housing. Do you agree? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. No, no. Let me let me ex allow me to expand. Uh, they're right. Yeah. Like the market is not broken. the The housing market is working exactly the way it was intended. The housing market was designed by liberals and conservatives to make rich investors lots of money to make developers lots of money. It is working. That's what it was designed to do. But you know who it's not working for? Young people, seniors, people on fixed income, families, working class people, everyone else. It's not working for them. And so we fundamentally have to change the way we approach housing. Yeah. And for sure, there's gonna be a, a space for private development of housing, sure. But that is not the solution on its own. Pierre Polyev tells you, just build, 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 but build what? Build more luxury condos? build more homes that people can't afford, that's not gonna solve the problem. Mm -hmm. What we need to do fundamentally is use the government power, money, and land and build homes that are affordable. And when we say affordable, affordable should mean that you have enough money left over after you pay your rent or your mortgage to save up some money, to pay your other bills, to go on a trip if you want, to buy the nice groceries that you need for your kids and your family. That's what we mean, right? A, a percentage of your salary where it leaves you with dignity to have enough left over to live a good life. And that is not gonna be achieved unless we invest in cooperatives, not-for-profit, housing, government really investing significantly and seriously to build homes that people can actually afford to live in. Those are good housing solutions, thank you. I got one more before sure. we send folks to go out and eat. Um, I eat. always feel nervous about standing between people and their and their food. You're gonna eat, okay? <laughs> but I thank you for being here. <laughs> That's very nice of you all. <laughs> um, ending in a good way. A lot of us at the summit have fond memories of Ed Broadman, mm. and I know that you two were very close. Yes. Um, you shared in the belief of making a good society, and I just want to know: Do you want to end with any final words of, of a moment or a time or like something that? You want to share with us? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'll, I touched on it, but maybe it was a bit too vague. It was like a little bit of an inside joke that Ed and I would have, where I would often like find him in the crowd and say to, there's Ed Broadband, everybody. He's who I'm going to be when I grow up. And what I mean by that, and what I meant by that, and I told Ed this as well, and I hope he, he knew what I meant, and I meant it from my heart. You got somebody who spent so much of their life in public service, like really committed to fighting for people. And he was a leader of the New Democratic Party, he used so much of his time and energy fighting for working class people. Coming up from Oshawa, it's something he really believed in. And so he did that. And no one would fault him for having dedicated so much time and then wanting to retire. But he didn't retire. Jack Leighton recruited him to run again, and so he ran again. And this is a big deal. You, you were the leader of the party, and then a next leader asked you to run. Like the humility and grace and kindness and generosity to say yes to that was huge. So he runs again. Okay, now he spends more time and he's done more. Okay, now he's done, right? And he's gonna retire now, he's fully earned it. No, in his retirement, he's like, let me start an institute that's gonna continue to fight for hardworking people and to fight for the working class. So he starts his institute that we're here for. That's still not enough. He's fully started this institute, founded it, gave it his name, it's doing great work. And then comes along a new leader who's like, hey, Ed, uh, would you be able to help me out? He has campaigned, he campaigned with me. He met with me numerous times. I would ask him for advice. He came and spoke to my caucus, to my team. Uh, the generosity he showed me as a new leader, I, I just, I can't thank him. I couldn't thank him enough. So when I mean that's who I want to be when I grow up, he never retired from fighting for working class people. He spent his whole life and continued to, to his last breath, fighting for that better world. And I wish I could do that as well. That's amazing. Thank you so much for hanging out with us, Jagmeet. Inspiring as always. Thank you, thank you.
and uh, we'll let these folks go for lunch. But give it again up for Jack Meat, folks. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate you all. Lori Anton. <laughs> Jack Meat.